Uh, this is an interview with William Harris in the Comfort Inn, Brooklyn, New York, uh, the 20th of March, 2003. 55th wedding anniversary. It is it. Congratulations. That's why I'm dressed. <laughs> Going out to dinner. <laughs> uh, it's approximately 10.30 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Well, my full name is William Borland Harris, B-O-R-L-A-N-D, is a family name. I was born in Glasgow, Scotland, at 39 Brandon Street, in Glasgow, March the 6th, 1918. Okay. And um, when did you uh, come to the United States? Uh, we came to the United States in November of 1924. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, were you, uh, what was your education prior to entering military service? I uh, had high school and I had uh, well, about three years, <coughs> excuse me, three years of American Institute of Banking at night while I was working in a bank in mm -hmm. New York City. Okay. Um, where were you and what do you remember about your reaction to the news about Pearl Harbor? Well, uh, I was drafted uh, months before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I was drafted uh, actually March the 20th, mm -hmm. same as today, 1941, at uh, which time they promises uh, one year. And in the summer of 1941, the Congress, by one vote, extended to two years. But the irritating part of that period was the fact that the, the draft was from 21 to 36. Uh, any men who were over 27 years old was, was stuck because in the summer of 41, they said that. Uh, they wouldn't draft anybody over 27. So if you were 28 up to 36 in the summer of 1941, you were stuck in the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, that continued on all the way up to about a month before Pearl Harbor, where these older men, I was only in my 20s, early 20s, so, but we had guys in the middle of 30s. It was pretty hard to keep up with them and them to keep up with us. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks prior, to, well, a month prior to Pearl Harbor, we went on the, what they call the Carolina Maneuvers, and. Uh, at the end of the maneuvers, they announced that all men over 27 years old would be released from the service. We got back to Fort Jackson, and uh, they were turning in their equipment. They stayed with us. They didn't have to go out in the field with us. They didn't have to drill with us. They laughed at us, kiddingly, and all that sort of stuff. However, on December the 7th, something very serious happened to our country. And uh, December the 8th, the sergeant came around and yelled at all those boys who were I turned in all their equipment that I go back down to the supply sergeant and get re-equipped mm -hmm. that we're in it now. And mm -hmm. that was uh, December the 8th, 1941. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I certainly do. I was, first of all, I never heard of Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. except in the movies. I remember seeing a movie one time, and uh, I, I, I roughly knew where it was. I didn't know their entire fleet was there. I never knew that. We didn't know that. I don't mm -hmm. think the average American knew mm -hmm. that. And uh, it was quite a shock. It was a very, very shock. I knew at that instant we were in it. You know, there was, mm -hmm. no, there was no getting out for anybody. And uh, I had a pretty good, uh, when we took the, uh, our entrance, well, not the, the examination going into the service, uh, I had a pretty high mark, and they were trying to interest me in going to the Fort Sill <laughs> Field Artillery Training School to become a field artillery officer. But uh, at that point, the... Uh, group of people from the United States Army Air Corps was going around asking anybody who had at least two years of college could take the entrance examination to become a flying cadet in those days. So I, I took the test and I passed. And uh, in the early spring of 42, I was uh, given a 90-day furlough, which the regular Army guys had never heard of because they were taking these boys into the Air Force and uh, there wasn't enough equipment or, or training uh, to, to handle them. So. Finally, in the summer of uh, 42, I was sent to Kelly Field, and from then on, went on the way through. And, uh, our class was one of the fastest classes to go through because they needed pilots in a hurry. So our class started in August, and we graduated in March, less than seven or eight months later. After that, they increased up to 12 months for pilot training because the, the washouts was unbelievable. Can I, can I go back a second? Sure. When you were uh, in the Army itself, um, you were in a field artillery unit? Field artillery, yeah. Um, did you ever use the horse-drawn artillery? No, was that was gone to... when we got there. Okay, they, I, I... We had the old stables. In other words, mm -hmm. they, they had already got rid of the horses and turned the stables with, into cement floors. Uh -huh. And uh, that was where the trucks were kept. Yeah, so. We interviewed someone who had 
Yeah, and they were I think in forty. Like, yeah, well, they were in the forty time. with the horses. Yeah, yes. yeah. They were gone by the time we got there. Mm -hmm. you know, they were okay. just got rid of them. Um, all right. So uh, in the Air Corps, then, uh, what kind of planes did you train on? Well, we trained on the old <coughs> PT-19. That was the plane that was open cockpit. Two men, well, of course, you instruct yourself. And then in basic training, we, you know, the old, we used to call the Volte vibrator. It was, it had a radio. It had uh, all sorts of instruments, which you didn't have in the primary trainers. Mm -hmm. And then in advanced flying school, we entered multi-engine planes and AT-17s and so forth. And uh, our primary job then was to, uh, <coughs> for two months, the trainers were the call medium bombardment, like uh, attacking railroads, highways, bridges, and so forth. So for two months since, until we graduated, that's all we trained. But when we graduated and we were getting our wings and our commissions and so forth, it turned out that the Navy had shot down about 80 transport planes in the invasion of Sicily, which was kept a top secret for a couple of years. And the entire class was going to be now assigned to Del Valley, Texas, to fly transports. And uh, I guess 95% of us were very upset because we thought we were going to be flying B-26 bombers. But when we got to Del Valley, the, the planes there were all commercial airliners, all silver, beautiful jobs, so it, it, it seemed a little interesting. So we checked out on them, and after that, then we were assigned to the various troop carrier squadrons. Uh -huh. And then well, I went back to, uh, let me see, Lawson Field in Georgia, uh, where we uh, trained paratroops dropping paratroopers and so forth, and then finally, in the fall, we were all shipped over to North Africa and picked and uh, how, how did you get across to North Africa? Well, we were supposed to fly the, with all sorts of instructions, but I'd never get a fly, actually from uh, Fort Wayne in Bearfield, Fort Wayne, Indiana, down to uh, Florida, Miami somewhere, and then on the way down to a place called Natal in Brazil. And from Brazil, you're going to fly across the Atlantic to the Ascension Island, and then from the Ascension Island, refuel and continue on into Africa itself. But at the last minute, that was called off. A brand new Navy transport ship was just delivered to Norfolk, and we're all assigned to that. So we come over with a, a fast Navy uh, transport that had no escort. It just zigzagged back and forth across the, the Atlantic. And they used, it was mostly a troop ship, but they took all the pilots, turned it into acting Navy officers for a while. You know, four hours on, eight hours off uh -huh. on the gun crews, and we didn't know anything about Navy regulations, but uh, we were strictly ar Army at the time. Uh -huh. But the trip lasted about ten days, and we ended up in a place called Casablanca. And at Casablanca, we were assigned to the various squadrons in North Africa. Uh -huh. And then from then on into Sicily, then on into Italy, then on to southern France, and the Rhineland, and the whole uh -huh. works. Yeah. Okay, what kind of uh, unit were you assigned to? Well, what happened to us, uh, most of the guys, we were in various troop carrier squadrons, but at that time General Eisenhower decided he wanted some sort of a service line to be running from Europe into the Mediterranean and keep it up. And it actually was called the Mediterranean Air Transport Service, MATS. Mm -hmm. And uh, they organized four squadrons of transport pilots. So they took most of the guys that had a lot of time, like myself, and they shipped us into this squadron in, in Naples, Italy. So all we did was fly personnel, we, we flew blood up in Duranzio in the beginning and all that sort of stuff. And then after that we just flew high class military personnel all through the Mediterranean and up into France and all the way to London and so forth. Uh -huh. Called MATS, you probably never heard of it. Not later on, until I read your... Well later on it became EATS, European Air Transport Service, and then finally it ended up with back into the old MATS again, Military Air Transport Service, which was combined with the Navy and the Air Force and to fly all over the world. But uh, we were the original boys that started it in the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, okay. our gang. Now, in fact, I'll show you something about it. Now, the, it now, did you ever uh, get shot at with flak? Well, or? I get shot at by Germans, and I get shot at by our own Navy. But other than that, <laughs> nothing else. Uh, what type of planes did you fly? C-47 mostly, but we flew mm -hmm. also B-25s, and we had a B B-17 that was used mostly for flying heavy mail back to Africa. One of the boys, uh, a few years back, down in Texas, uh, he brought up a little report once a month for a while, and it lasted for a few years, and we all packed it in. It was, as he said, it was Mediterranean Air Transport Service, uh -huh. and uh, 
I'd like you to read the uh, epilogue that he wrote, which was very interesting because it applied to us. Uh, appears right here. It's only a short piece. You might be interested in reading it. But I, thought it I was going to say, did you want to read that on camera? I could probably do that. Sure. Would you like that? Sure. All right. I'll have to, I'm 85 years old now. I'm no longer the 22-year-old Air Force pilot. <laughs> Okay, the epilogue. This this uh, magazine, technically wasn't a magazine, it was a newspaper <coughs> turned out by one of our guys, Bob Dean, who lived in Texas, and uh, he retired, I think he's a full colonel, and he decided to uh, get a little paper together so the boys could sort of write it, see what was going on, who they were, where they were, what they remembered, so forth. And then they, they attached various pictures, and pictures of the guys, and pictures of the planes and so forth. But anyhow, this was his last issue from Bob, and he wrote, uh, uh, let's see what he said. All, all you former members, pilots, crew members, and ground support personnel of the Mediterranean Air Transport Service during World War II should have deep pride in having been a part of an organization that did so much while receiving so such little recognition for bringing that war to an end. We can expect that history books will rarely, if ever, ever, even mention the name, let alone the exploits of this great organization. But we, underline, know, and hopefully our descendants will know. It was with great pleasure that I was able to put this newsletter together, knowing that it was appreciated by many of you. It would not have been possible if you had not contributed to this effort. Thank you for allowing me to be a closer part of our history. God bless you all. Bob. I thought it was very nice when uh -huh. Bob wrote that. Uh -huh. um, how many hours did you fly as a, as a pilot? In well, I, when I retired, it was over 2,035 hours. I, uh -huh. I put in over 1,350 what they call combat hours uh -huh. in the Mediterranean area in Europe. They said that it was 1,000. Was First it was 500 maximum for transport pilots. And then they raised it up to 1,000. <laughs> and then when I was supposed to go home, uh, uh, we're getting real replacements, and uh, we were told that we wouldn't get enough replacements. So as a result, would uh, any of the boys volunteer to stay on? So since I wasn't married at the time, I said, "Oh, I'll stay on, and we'll let the married guys go." So they released about 25 of the married guys pilots out of our squadron, and we received about 25 recruits pilots uh -huh. coming in from the United States. Uh -huh. And I stayed there until uh, May, at which point I ran up close to 1,350 hours, which was a lot more than the average mm -hmm. for the. Now I noticed in the form you filled out you had a, a very unique uh, mission in 1944. Uh -huh. What was, so you, you talked about that, that a sure. little bit please. 1944, they, uh, it was, we were in Africa at the time and they, they woke us up about 3 o'clock in the morning and brought us out to a sort of briefing area and they said that uh, it was a top secret mission. Uh, at the time, the, our bombers were leaving Italy and flying across the Mediterranean into Yugoslavia and then hitting the Ploesti oil fields. They were accompanied by uh, fighter pilots. Our uh, fighter pilots had wing tanks, and uh, it was almost like the Battle of Britain. When uh, the boys got across Yugoslavia, the Germans would come up to meet the bombers in the formations and they would attack. Our fighter pilots would drop their wing tanks, and after an hour or so combat, escorting the bombers, they had to get back. Uh -huh. So the bombers went practically unescorted all the way to Ploesti, and when they got there, they got the hell kicked out of them. Uh -huh. And on their way back, now the Germans were refueled and supplied, and they'd come up and meet them on their way back before they got to us, so they hit them again. So they came up with an idea that uh, if wing tanks were flown by transport pilots all the way from North Africa, all the way through Cairo, Egypt, all the way up to Tehran, all the way up into Russia, to a place called Poltava, which was a technically a secret Russian base because Russia and Japan were not at war. As a result, uh, Russia didn't want the Japanese to know that they had given the Americans an air base in the Ukraine. And uh, anyhow, we got to the Ukraine and we delivered our wing tanks. In the at that time, the next morning, the bombers came in with the fighters and uh, no wing tanks. But the next morning, they left again with a full load of wing tanks and a full load of supplies, and they hit the Germans and deployed the oil fields again. Uh, that lasted maybe 30 days until the Germans found out that uh, they sent over, we saw the vapor trails, and they knew that a 
somebody looking for that big base. It wasn't it wasn't a very large base, just enough to hold maybe a couple of squadrons of bombers and a squadron of fighter pilots, plus us. So they hit the base heavily, the Germans, and probably destroyed it. But we were lucky. We were off. They'd moved us off into the outskirts, into a smaller area of Poltava that the Germans didn't hit. But the next morning, we were our planes were safe and we were ordered to leave. And we were, flew back through the same route, back through Baghdad, all the way back into Cairo, Egypt. And we landed there June the 6th, which was the day the boys hit Normandy. Now, we never even knew about a place called Normandy. I never ever heard of it. You know. uh -huh. And we were very excited, naturally, that the boys had finally hit Europe. And our colonel gave us three days to have a good time in uh, Cairo, which was like being in New York City. They had a drugstore there called Grappi's Drugstore that served you ice cream, sodas, and malted milks, things that you couldn't get in the war zone. Uh -huh. you know. and it was very good, and we were very happy to be there. We lived well, we dined well, and the city itself was beautiful, and it was just like being in New York. Egypt was not a war. You know, Egypt was a neutral country, even though the British and the Germans uh -huh. had fought back and forth through there. Anyhow, the, one of the boys wrote a little article, which was too big to even read here, but with our trip to uh, Russians, and I just took it with me in case you want to take a quick look at it. But this, this I took out of the newspapers the other day. It said well, the Russians are going to Grozny, you know, they're fighting there with their, uh -huh. there's an uprising there. And beyond that, there's a place called Mahachkala. And I little started, that was the place where we landed to get fuel and so forth, and uh -huh. lunch, et cetera. That was, one of the boys wrote that up after our mission was accomplished. Nobody got any medals. We didn't get, uh, we didn't get, thank you. Do you have any uh, photographs to show us of when you were in service? Oh, yeah, a few. Okay. I got one beauty one. Let's see, well, this was, uh, let's see. <laughs> now, when was that? 62 taken? years ago, 1942. Now, don't smile. You're laughing and so forth. One day you'll be 85 yeah, and you'll I know, I know, I know you'll look a little bit so. like it. i got a couple others you like. You want to take? Sure. All right, let's go. Uh, this is when a hot shot pilot. Yeah. You know, that's when I, I got out of flying school and uh, they wanted to take out a picture. Now, when was that taken? Uh, that was 19, uh, late 1942 before we graduated. Okay. And you may, I, one other thing I just did bring was, uh, I don't know whether you'll ever see, you'll ever see the, one of these, because the, the old Army Air Force diploma, you know, if you'd like to see that. Oh, yeah. Yes, if you. And that would take it. Hold it back a you little bit, hold, a little so, bit more, and then uh, Wayne will be able to focus yeah, right, on it. Right. That uh, gives an example of the Army mm -hmm. Air Force prescribed, I passed the prescribed <coughs> pilots training and so forth. Now, you uh, stayed in uh, the service until 78. Yeah, well, what happened, I stayed in the reserve. Uh -huh. uh, I was at, at stationed at Floyd Bennett for, after the war for a few years, then that was closed. Then after that, they moved us into 640 Washington Street for, like, they turned me since I had some banking experience into a finance officer. Okay. So uh, my pilot, I, was, I used to be pilot one, finance uh -huh. officer two. Then as the years passed, they turned into uh, finance officer one. Uh -huh. Pilot, so. uh -huh. and that continued all the way through till I finally retired. Uh -huh. Now, do you still have your old uh, flying jacket? Uh, no, I don't have my old flying jacket anymore. I, uh, oh, well, I, yes, I have my uniforms. So part of my old military uniform from uh -huh. the war. Then, of course, we went into the blue. You know that. Uh -huh. And I'll show you what happened. About three years ago, <coughs> in the retired officers' association. They, they mentioned that anybody who participated in the shuttle bombing mission in 1944 should contact the Russian embassy in New York, and, uh, and they, were, they were issuing a medal, not our government, mm -hmm. the Russian government. So uh, I, uh, I wrote to the, I called up the Russian embassy in New York, and they referred me to somebody in Washington, and I wrote to them, and they in turn sent me the letter back. And uh, I don't know whether you could read that, if you can. Could I pick that up? I don't know. That's the, gen general, uh, the, the Russian uh, premier with belts, isn't it? It'd be hard to pick up. Isn't it? Yeah, I, can, I can get it. It's just trying to get the whole thing in. 
Well, now you're nervous. You have a gun pointing at you, Lucille. <laughs> okay. I got right. it. Well, what happened was they sent. Uh, I never knew what Cyrillic meant in my life. Uh, I really didn't know. Uh -huh. Cyrillic is a Russian uh, way of it, it, writing from from our English translation to the, this their language. Uh, it seems that. What I read or heard that a Saint Cyril about a thousand years ago converted the Russians to Christianity. And he introduced uh, their type of writing. And uh, Boris Yeltsin signed this card. And uh, on the top of, that, top of that card is my name, William B. Harris, in Cyrillics. And the issue is this, this very pretty little metal. Okay, can you hold it back farther, sure. closer to you? How is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you turn it? Is there anything? Yeah, the, well, the back is just mostly the, for oh, them to okay. pin it on if you want to take that. What's that say, 50th anniversary? It says the 50th anniversary of the Great Patriotic War. That's what the Russians call it. And in Russian, it's got Cyrillic on one side, it's got English on the other, saying... 1945-1995, which was the 50th anniversary of the, the big war. Okay. Now, uh, did you, um, when you returned mm -hmm. home, uh, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? No, I never did because uh, I, I went right back to working in the bank and staying uh -huh. in the military, the Air Reserve, and uh, schools through the bank, you know, banking schools and so uh -huh, forth, to uh -huh. advance myself a little bit. Um, did you, have you uh, kept in contact with anyone that you served with? Oh yeah, uh, my best friend, well, there was about, I don't know, about 60 of us in the squadron, and there was, uh, they're all gone. Uh, the last one is my pal out in Carmel, California, Stanley Jorgensen, he was a navigator, and uh, we still kind of have contact with each other, uh -huh. and we still talk to each other. And uh, about ten years ago, we had a reunion. It was about twenty of us showed up, and then uh, about two or two years later, we had a second reunion, That's and true. about fifteen to twenty yeah. showed up. That's they were wives. That we had uh -huh. never, you know, we never uh -huh. known. It was quite a get together out in a place called Carmel. It's a beautiful city, Carmel, California. Uh -huh. and, uh, that's how uh, the boys and I got to together. Um, have you joined any veterans organizations? Yeah, or I, well, I belong to the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I'm also a member of the Retired Officers Association, which is now called the Military Officers Association. They changed the name this year. I don't know if you knew that or not. No. I didn't. Well, the, the T R O A spells out the Retired Officers Association. Mm -hmm. And it's been in existence for about 60 years, and they found out that uh, a lot of military officers in their 40s coming out of the service don't like to join anything that says retired. So uh, about a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, they decided to have a little vote, went all the way through, there's about 400,000 of them. So they voted to change the name to the Military Organization of America. So it's M-O-A, Military Organization of America. And uh, that went into effect uh, as of January 1 of this year. And uh, we were up at last year at a reunion with the TROA up in Albany, and <laughs> they have the flags they put up in the, what they call the hospitality room. That's where they keep the beer mm -hmm. and so forth. And <laughs> the boys up there said that we're still going to put up the TROA. They've been there for years, you know. But they feel that uh, by the same military organization, a lot of military officers coming out in their 40s will join. Mm -hmm. And it's important because they were very active in pushing through the new bills that we got. You know, when Clinton took over, we lost a lot. I don't know whether you fellas knew that or not. Yeah. Whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I'm a conservative. Yeah. But anyhow, we lost everything. We lost dental work. We lost everything. And finally, after eight years with the TROA fighting in the Congress and all that, we got everything back. And the bill was signed in action about a few, about six months ago. Whereas if you're over 65, which covers my wife and myself, that we're covered by both the military and the, uh, what does that be, the other thing, the uh, Medicare, or not, 
Medicare. Yeah, Medicare. 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 So we still have to pay $55 a month each for Medicare, but all bills that we acquire now through the hospitals and military hospitals will be taken care of. And they finally come in with a, a dental plan. We're taking $25 a month out of our, our retirement plan, and I think that's going to be increasing this year. I don't know if we have any letters. So we're not getting away with anything. We're still paying 100 and something a month. For, for military care, mm -hmm. and we're paying at this point 25 a month for dental care, and uh, so technically we're not getting away with anything yet. Mm -hmm. Up till 12 years ago, I could go to Bailey Seton Hospital over in Staten Island, and they uh, fix my teeth up, eyeglasses. Uh, eyeglasses, everything. Now I buy my glasses. Mm -hmm. You can't. There's no they're not free. I've got to my dental care. I've got to pay for it, mm -hmm. which I didn't have up till 12 years ago. The Congress said that, they, in fact, they were sued, you know. They said that when you join the military, if you want to put your leash your 20 years in, that you were set for life for health care. But then the, Cong the, the Supreme Court said that even though the government promised it, it was only a promise. It was not in writing. And yet up until a few years ago, the Marine Corps was still recruiting their boys by saying that you, after you put 20 years in, you'll still get full medical care for the rest of your life, which was not true. So they had to stop doing that. Uh, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah.